Yeah, are you ready for this? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. You sure you're sure? Yes. Okay, uh, let's have a, let's make sure you're engaged first of all. Um, who's had a coffee this morning? Hand, hands up straight away if you've had a coffee this morning. Straight away, come on. Okay, hands down. Uh, if you have more than one coffee this morning, more than two coffees this morning, come on, be honest. More than three coffees this morning. No more than three. Oh, good. We have two, uh, two finalists here. More than four coffees this morning. Okay, I'm a two coffees this morning. A uh, glass of wine last night. Who had a glass of wine last night? Okay. So half of you are lying. Okay. Re ready for the next one? Yeah? Who voted Brexit? <laughs> Very brave. <laughs> Round of applause. Have you changed your mind? No? Just thought I'd get that one out of the way. Always funny. Okay. Um, anybody know what, what this is? Anybody know who that is? It's my wife. <laughs> I know she's punching above her weight, but... She... <laughs> anybody know what this is? Come on! What is it? A bookmark? Ah, oh, now here we go. So it is a bookmark, but it's not just any bookmark, okay? It's a Marlowe bookshop bookmark. One of the greatest bookshops in the world. Yeah, it's gorgeous, isn't it? it is. Smells nice. It is nice. The people that work in it smell nice and are nice. But this is not just any Marlowe bookmark, because this has got the Brian Cox interview on it. <laughs> OK, because he's so clever and so articulate and has such a big brain, that's all the questions I'm going to need. <laughs> In fact, can I just tell you, this is the third time I've used this bookmark, and I'm only up to there. <laughs> Shall we meet him? Yeah. Please welcome Professor Brian Cox. <laughs> How are you, Brian? Thank you. Very good. Thank you. So, I might not need this, but if I do, can you just... Okay. <laughs> Don't steal any of my questions. Brian, let's, uh, let's start in the shallow end. Yeah. First of all, how are you, by the way? You all right? Very well. Excellent. Okay. We'll start in the shallow end. Um, how's the hunt for dark matter going? <laughs> Would you like me to explain what it is? Yeah, I think first? so, because it's quite important, isn't it, dark matter? It, it is. I mean, we, so we have a, a theory of... Uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity which is interesting in itself because it started 1905-ish as the special theory of relativity, a theory of space and time, which is an unusual thing to say. You might say, why do we need a theory of space and time? And we can perhaps talk about that. I have to get to your <laughs> question. <laughs> it then became... See what I mean? I can, I can see you later. <laughs> have a lovely festival. <laughs> it, it then became a theory of gravity in 1915, which is the general theory of relativity and subsequently became a theory of cosmology, which is a theory of the evolution of the universe, large-scale structure and evolution of the universe. So that theory allows us to uh, essentially look out into the universe, look, see how things move, and indeed how the universe behaves, so whether it's expanding or contracting, and that allows us to infer how much stuff is in the universe. I mean, what, what the theory actually does is on a cosmological scale, is to say, you tell me what, what the contents of the universe are, and I will tell you how the universe behaves, if it's going to expand or contract, or what it's doing. And so by measuring how it's behaving, we can infer what's in it, which is the flip side of that. And when we do that, when we look at many different things, the way that galaxies rotate, the way that clusters of galaxies behave and move, we see that there's more stuff in the universe, more matter, than we can account for by looking at uh, the amount of matter in the stars that shine or the dust that we can see in the universe. So the, the inference is from those measurements that there is a kind of particle out there, a constituent of matter, which we have not yet discovered. So we don't know the nature of it. It's not this stuff, the stuff out of which we and all the stars and planets and galaxies are made. It's something else. And it doesn't interact with light, otherwise we would see it. So that's why we call it dark matter. So it's something that we infer the presence of. And I should say there's uh, current measurements, multiple measurements tell us there's probably five times as much of that as there is of this. 
So when you look at the stars, you know, Milky Way galaxy, 200 billion stars, lots of gas and dust there, two trillion galaxies in the observable universe. I mean, think of that number, two trillion things the size of the Milky Way. That, that there's five times more stuff than that, right? Which is, so that's what we call dark matter. And to answer your question, um, so we infer its existence. So we're looking for it. We're looking for whatever new kind of particle we're pretty sure it is. We're looking. So, for example, at the LHC at CERN, um, we, we thought probably by now, running the Large Hadron Collider, that we would have made this kind of matter. Um, but we haven't seen it. So, so it's one of the great puzzles. It, it's, uh, uh, it's possible that we're wrong. Right? It's possible that Einstein's theory is getting it wrong somehow or there's some other explanation, but we do think that it's most likely there's something else, which is kind of fascinating, isn't it? A, a new building block of matter that behaves in a different way. And but people today, it. scientists today, this morning, so some people are fishing in the Thames, yeah? yeah? Some people are tending their allotments, we're all here. There are scientists this morning still literally hunting down the dark Yeah, matter. there are two ways. You can either hope to make it in particle accelerators. Um, what, what they do really is they, they're very high energy collisions. And going back to Einstein, E equals mc squared. You have lots of energy, you can make a lot of mass, you can make things. And so we are at the LHC looking for these new particles. But there's also in under mountains, which as you said, there are people fishing in rivers, there are people under mountains, in the Mont Blanc tunnel actually, if you go through that tunnel, that there are experiments in there. The reason you put them under mountains is because there are lots of interference, cosmic rays, particles from space come and go through your detectors and make it noisy on the ground. But underground, you reduce all that. And what they're looking for is the very rare occasion when these, these particles, which we're swimming in, if this is right, we're in a sea of these things now, an ocean of them. But they interact very, very weakly with this stuff, with us, very weakly. So the idea is that occasionally one of these heavy things would bump into the detector under the mountain and you would see that collision. So, you'd see, so that's d what's called direct detection. So yeah, there are people looking. And we're and only looking, looking for, for one years. little, what the first sign of evidence, which is minute, really but it's, there's so much of it, you know, collectively, if it exists at all, yeah. but we've just, we can't find a single trace of it, which is mad, it's, and recently people are wobbling on this, aren't they? The, yeah. So if it isn't dark matter, the extra volume, what, what might it be then? Well, as I say, it could be that, so the way we infer its existence is through our theory of gravity which tells us how things should move, given an amount of stuff. So it could be that the theory of gravity is not right. It could, it could be. Now, that's a very bold thing to say, though, because Einstein's theory of gravity is one of the other things we've just seen recently, the collision of black holes. So this incredible measurements over the last four years where we see colliding black holes over a billion light years away, some of these things. And, and you see this violent uh, ripple in the fabric of the universe that goes out. I'll just give you one example. The, 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 the black holes that we're seeing collide are of order 30 times the mass of the sun each, right? So these things which have collapsed down to a single point as far as we know, so unimaginably violent. And we see these things, that they spiral around each other and they, that means they shape the fabric of the universe itself and they, so they lose energy and they spiral in and they collide. And the, the collision, one of the first collision we saw, these two things, 30 times the mass of the sun, uh, at one moment they were approaching each other, spiraling in at one third the speed of light, which is very fast. You know, light travels at 186,000 miles a second, or 300,000 kilometers per second. It's miles for the Brexit voters and kilometers for <laughs> <laughs> six of you there. Um, and, um, sorry. And uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, and then within one-tenth of a second, yeah. they'd accelerated to two-thirds the speed of light. Imagine that accelerate. I mean, you're yeah. a car person. Imagine you go from one-third to two-thirds the speed of light in a tenth of a second. A tenth of a second later, they collided. And in that collision, the amount of energy released exceeded the total energy of all the stars in the universe in two trillion galaxies by a factor of 50, right? So this is a hell of a bang. And what happens is the ripples go out, and we detect them uh, a billion years after the collision because they've come across the universe. And we, we, the, the prediction of how space rippled in our detectors was exactly that predicted by Einstein's theory that came out of his head, essentially, in 1915 when he knew nothing of the existence of such things. So we're pretty confident the theory's good. Uh, but it could be, there's always that chance that it's not right. Glad you had those coffees now. <laughs>
how the hangover was feeling. This will <laughs> wipe them away. So you've got Einstein's theory of relativity and his theory of gravity. And because of the dark matter issue, he used to put things in when he wasn't sure about things. He used to uh, introduce something called the fudge factor, didn't he? Yeah. Well, he didn't call it the fudge factor, but I you're right. I thought he did call it the fudge well, factor. Well, they call it the cosmological constant. It's a... Oh, <laughs> oh. It's <near. laughs> I'm going with fudge factor. It is. I don't give a fudge. You're anyway. right, though, the fudge factor. That, that was their... That, again, it's a re interesting story, because I, I said, just briefly, this thing was a theory of gravity, which... Um, so the first thing he calculated was the orbit of Mercury around the Sun, uh, because there were slight discrepancies from the orbit predicted by Newton's laws. And people thought there might be another planet there and all sorts of things. But it turned out that Newton's laws were wrong. Right? And, and, and Einstein managed to predict the orbit of Mercury. So that's a theory of gravity. But then about two years afterwards, he thought, if you can apply my theory to a solar system, then why can't you apply it to a universe? Which is a tremendous intellectual leap. To, and it's not obvious you can. Um, but the idea was that if you knew the matter distribution of the universe, so how matter is distributed, then you could stick that into his equations and out would come the shape of the universe in space and time, so the history of the universe, past, present, and future. So that's that he noticed that, in principle, his theory could do that. So he did it, and, and he, he made a very simple assumption, which is that on the average, across the universe, matter is uniformly distributed. And if you do that, you can solve the equations and you get out the answer. The answer is that the universe doesn't, the fabric of the universe itself tends to stretch or shrink, always. It doesn't stay constant. So it's stretching or shrinking in response to all the stuff that's in it. And, and he didn't like that at all because he had a philosophical predisposition at the time for an eternal universe. So he he'd had this physical intuition that nature should have always existed and should always exist. And so this idea that the universe is changing according to his theory really does open up the possibility that it began Right, there's a moment of creation, is it? And he didn't like it. So he, he put the fudge factor in, as you say, and that's really what it is. So now it, you have to call it a fudge factor. It's, well, it's mathematically allowed. <laughs> okay. But it's, so, so it's not bizarre to put it in, but it's an extra term. In, and he tried to use it to balance this tendency of the universe, in his theory, to change. And you can't. It's like balancing a pen on the point of the pen, you know, a pencil or something. It doesn't. It falls over. So, so he, he abandoned it. And then he called it later the greatest blunder of his life. Um, but it's actually, it, it turns out it is there now. So, so it's, it was allowed mathematically, it is there. And um, we now call it dark energy, which is another thing, which is so the universe is accelerating in its expansion. But the point was he introduced it to avoid this conclusion that there may have been an origin. Because if you imagine, if the universe is stretching now, then you imagine in the past everything might have been closer together. And so there's this sense that everything may have been on top of each other. Um, and actually, just interestingly, a man called Georges Lemaitre, who's a great sort of hero of mine in many ways, an interesting man, a Catholic priest as well as a mathematician and a physicist, um, took the, the, the prediction more seriously and began speaking in this poetic manner, actually, in terms of a day without a yesterday. And he'd started saying things to Einstein, like, your theory suggests there was a day without a yesterday. And Einstein, that's a very famous quote, actually. Einstein said, your, your uh, mathematics and physics are excellent, but your physical intuition is lousy. <laughs> to him, because he thought this, his intuition was, you can't have a day without a yesterday. Yeah. You can't have a beginning. Of course, Lemaitre was a priest. So he's far more comfortable with this idea that um, there's an origin to the universe. I should say, we, we could talk about it later, but we don't know, actually. What we know is that 13.8 billion years ago, the universe was very hot and very dense. So Lemaitre was correct. The theory is correct, basically. There's a time when everything was close together. But whether that's the origin is not known. So you're getting now to the point where, and I don't know if, if you're sort of um, prepping the ground uh, for, for the, the response to the next suggestion of a question, which is, is, is it true, right, that all cosmologists around the world have a secret pact, right, <laughs> That when they come to things like this and get asked the next question that I'm going to ask you, you've all agreed on an answer to get you out of the problem. And the question is, um, what happened before the Big Bang? And your agreed answer that you had at your secret meeting somewhere is, that question is meaningless. Please unask it. 
it's like saying what's south of the South Pole? Um, no. The, first of all, <laughs> first of all, first of all, physicists, it would be herding cats. I mean, there's no way you can get them to agree on when to have coffee, right? Never mind. Anything else. <laughs> so it's all academics are the same. But um, so there is an answer to that, um, which is almost textbook. Um, it, the, there's a semantic point first, which is how you define what you mean by the Big Bang, right? So what we tended to mean in the past is the time when the universe was very hot and very dense. And we have a very good measurement of the very accurate. So how long ago was everything very hot and very dense in the universe? And it's 13.8 billion years. And it's, a, it's a refined all the time, but it's a very accurate measurement. But then, so the question is, was the universe in existence before it was hot and dense? And we have no measurement of that. We have a measurement back to the hot, dense time. And the, we have a the, the, the most popular theory at the moment is called inflation, which was developed throughout the 1980s. And um, actually, Stephen Hawking and others played a key role in this theory. He's most famous for black holes, but also in this idea. And the idea is that space and time, so the fabric of the universe, were in existence before the universe was hot and dense. And they were expanding. It's, you know, it's expanding now, but relatively slowly. Um, it was expanding then, we think, extremely fast. Um, doubling in size, actually. If you take two points in this space, and you say, how long did it take them to double in distance? It, uh, the answer is, in scientific language, 10 to the minus 37 seconds. So that's point not, 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 not one of a second, right? So this is an extreme expansion. And the idea is that that drew to a close. So it sort of tailed off, and in doing so, the, the energy that was driving that collapsed, sort of collapsed and changed and heated the universe up and made all the particles out of which we are now made, and everything's made. And so that's called inflation. Uh, it was introduced in the 80s to solve some so technical problems about the, the universe, but actually, after it was introduced, it, it, it was discovered, and this was Hawking and and a few other people at a conference they had in Cambridge in the 80s, they discovered that you can calculate um, in this, 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 this pre-existing universe what happens when, when uh, quantum mechanics makes things fluctuate around and, and, and all this sort of stuff. And essentially, what pattern would you get written across the sky today if our whole visible universe, the observable universe, was seeded in this kind of event? Right, the end of inflation and the Big Bang and so on. And, and they got the answer right, which was not part of the theory. So it literally, it predicts the distribution of galaxies on the sky. So we, we observe where the galaxies are, how far away they are, what the pattern they make is. And there is actually a characteristic pattern in them. And incredibly, the characteristic pattern is the pattern of the subatomic world. And so the idea really is that, that our whole observable universe, which had two trillion galaxies, um, could have begun in this little patch of space and time way back there, which was much smaller than an atom. Um, and this patch expanded to all this stuff. And the little wobbles in that little subatomic little patch get essentially ripped apart and written across the sky by this expansion. And it's, an, it's astonishing that we get the right answer. So it's quite most, I would say most, not all, but most cosmologists accept that as the baseline idea. There's one extra thing, because you're saying that you're right that that doesn't dodge the next question, which is, which is but was there an origin then? So, so you, you might was say, well, before? what I mean by the Big Bang is the origin of the universe. Yeah. So I, I accept the fact that the thing we used to call the Big Bang might not be the origin, there's something before that. Does the something before that have a beginning? Yeah. And honestly, we don't know. Um, there's a very simple reason for that, which is that, Einstein's theory, which is what we use for that whole framework, um, is not the final word on the matter. That, that there is, we are searching for what's called a quantum theory of gravity, which is a, a, a one that would work at the center of a black hole, or at the origin of the universe, if, if there is such a thing. And we don't have that theory. So, so the honest answer is to the, to the question, did the universe have a beginning, in, is, is we don't know. Um, there, there are, so, and that's, I think that's really important, actually. We, we discuss what science is. There's, um, it, the, Richard Feynman, the great Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist, said once that he defines science as a satisfactory philosophy of ignorance, which is a beautiful definition. Because he says that, there's a great, I can't remember the quote exactly, but he says, uh, 
he says, what is the meaning of it all? He's got this beautiful essay called The Value of Science. And he says, what is the meaning of it all? And then he says, uh, ultimately, we must accept that we do not know. But in saying that, we may have found the open channel, which I think is a very important thing. So, so the knowledge stops. So I can't answer the question is the basic point. Not Soldier. because I want to dodge it, but no, no, no. we don't have an answer. I, don't, I, I was just But isn't it fascinating? It's, just a joke. it's fascinating that we don't know even whether the universe had an origin or is eternal. That that's, we don't actually know the answer to that question. So there's the inflation theory, and then there's the complex theory as well. And so there's the complex theory that there was something before, but it became so complex. Yeah, there, there are theories. There Too are other... complex for itself almost, and then it had to expand. Yeah, there are, kind of, there, there are other theories. There's a cyclical sort of cosmology. Um, Roger Penrose, the great... A physicist and mathematician and an author um, uh, sort of speaks of these theories where you, the universe can expand and then sort of change into the, the beginnings of another universe. And as, um, it, as the universe expands, it, you know, in what direction are, are galaxies going away from each other? Is, there, is, are there, is it a random direction? Is there a centre that they're all sort of running away from? They seem to be running away from us. Have we done something wrong? No, they're, they're all... The, the thing about the universe, imagine it as this tabletop. Um, then... All, all we see is we see the stretching of the tabletop. So we see, if you imagine dots on that table and just stretched it, then all the dots would fly away from all the other dots. And that's what we see. So, so we, the, the universe could well be infinite. I mean, it's another thing we don't know. We, we're very sure that it's much bigger than the bit we can see. Um, there's a limit to how far you can see, because I said that it's 13.8 um, billion years ago, there was this big bang thing, whatever it is. So that means that Light, light as if there was something that was a 200 billion light years away, then the light would not have had time to reach us, right? So, so the universe can be infinite, um, and it can still stretch, though. If you think I get asked this a lot, like what's it stretching into? You just imagine an infinite sheet. Well, it can still the distance between any two points can stretch, but the thing can be infinite yeah, because so it doesn't break because there's nothing in between. It just it. stretches. Yeah. So, so that, that, that's what we know is the fabric of the universe in Einstein's model. Stretches. <laughs> and that's what we measure. So that's the measurement. Einstein or Hawking? <laughs> if, if they had a, an intellectual fight, who would win? The, I, don't, I mean, I, the thing about Einstein is that um, he... You, you have to be careful, because this, you know, there'll be historians in the audience, and this kind of great person idea of scientific progress is quite w correctly contested. But I think in Einstein's case, his theory of gravity comes out of almost nothing apart from almost philosophical thought. Right? I mean, his theory of space-time, which I mentioned, that came from experiment. I mean, we, it's very, I'm teaching it at the moment. I was teaching it yesterday in Manchester. So to, to, we teach it to first-year undergraduates. And it's a very simple point. It was, there was an observation in the 1860s or so, part observation, part theory, that the speed of light is always the same. And it was very heavily suggested by experiments with Faraday and Ampere and all these people. And then James Clerk Maxwell, Scottish physicist, brought it together and said, the speed of light, it looks like it's a constant. And that's a really weird thing to say. Because, I mean, you know, what we think of speed, if I, if I ran to, towards you at 10 miles an hour, 16 kilometers an hour, and, a, and, and threw a ball th towards you at 10 miles an hour, it would go past you at 20 miles an hour, right? You just, that's speed. But it turns out that's not the way that nature is when you're speaking about light. It turns out that however you move, however the emitter of the light moves or the receiver, however anything happens, you always see the speed of light go at the same speed. And actually, there's a great physicist, Robert Gerosh, who, who said, it's as if light moves, only cares about the fabric of the universe itself. It always goes through at the same speed. It doesn't care about what emitted it or what received it. It cares about the fabric. And this was observed in the 1860s. From that, it is natural to build Einstein's new theory of space and time. And there are actually many people working on it. And, and he got there first, and you get equals mc squared and all that stuff. Uh, so, so that's kind of, you don't have to be, you have to be a, a, a genius, but you don't have to be some great genius to do that. But the conversion of that into a theory of gravity, when you read about it, is so elegant and so beautiful and so personal to the way that Einstein thought that I think many people think it, it wouldn't have happened perhaps for decades that that theory it potentially it's a very strange way of thinking about gravity as geometry you, it's it's a and it comes from an aesthetic sense I think 
But he was once asked, actually, about, uh, he said, someone said, what would you think if um, your theory, general relativity, was shown experimentally to be incorrect? And he said, I would pity the poor Lord. Because <laughs> he thought that God would have missed a trick if he'd not <laughs> built this elegant universe based on his beautiful theory. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful piece of work. But because he, so, he, I mean, the thing about Einstein is because he has that sense of poetry and, and art within him, do you think that yeah. helps him to get to the elegance of formula with, with other people who are more so binary may not, may not have got there in the end? I, I think so. I think there is a, a strong element of an, an aesthetic sense that drives theories like that. There's a belief that the, you see many theoretical physicists, they use the word beautiful. They think that nature should be beautiful, or nature is beautiful, and therefore the underlying laws that govern it should be beautiful. In, in a, and you can, you know, in a mathematical sense or an elegant sense. Or, and that, that, what's interesting about that is it's a, it, it comes from experience. It turns out that yes, elegance, mathematical elegance does seem to be a guide to the way that the, the universe is, or the underlying laws are. And you could say that's a great mystery. Um, there's also another point of view, which I take, which is that we live in a highly ordered universe, obviously, because structures like this exist within it. So, and, and remember, these things, us, civilization, not only planets, but intelligence, these things um, emerged according to the action of a few laws of nature. And so you, you need a, a predictable, elegant structure in order to produce elegant structures, I think. And so we, we're, it, it's not a surprise, I think, that we see um, a logical structure under, underlying nature, because nature is highly structured. The, pro the product of it is highly structured. Let's talk about nature. Let's talk about the weather, shall yeah. we? We're in England. We're, we're <laughs> in the UK, we're British. Let's talk about the weather. Um, What's going on? Uh, <laughs> well, so that's, I'd say that's it's about what, to rain. <laughs> yeah. I know what you mean. No, no, so this week, so climate, the climate yeah. um, uh, summit in New York. So, so from that, lots of information. Greta Thunberg, we'll get onto her in a minute, and uh, other people who may be prominent and useful and helpful and on the right side of the tracks. Um, but the, the three, three huge um, pieces of research that came out since 1967... It was announced this week, since 1967, we've lost a million square miles of the Arctic. We're losing currently 650 billion cubic tonnes of ice per year. Um, the sea levels are rising by four millimetres per year now. Uh, within tens of years, that will be centimetres, and within 100 years, that will be metres per year. Mm. Um, weather is becoming more extreme, obviously getting warmer, therefore it'll get wetter. Um, what... what what did, were you, what did you, are you having conversations about this in your world? Y yes, I mean, it's the, the thing to say is that it's, um, I think it's one of the great tragedies, it might be the great tragedy in, in recent history or possibly in our history that the, 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 the climate has become politicised. It, it's not an obvious thing. If you didn't know anything about our world and about the way that we do politics, that if you start at the beginning, you say, is it a good, good idea to ask the question, uh, how might our climate change if we do this? Or if we observe that the climate is changing, which is, I should define what climate is, it's, what's called, it's a probability of weather. So it's actually a, an ex-PhD student of mine um, is now a climate scientist, and she always says that uh, it's, what you have to understand is it's, it, Weather is like, in some sense, predicting a single coin toss, right? It's quite hard. But predicting the outcome of a thousand coin tosses is quite is easier. And so actually long-term climate is easier to predict than short-term weather because it's the probability of weather. And so you, you start with a simple question, which is we observe, we, we've got all these satellites measuring all these things, data sets for decades, if not hundreds of years. We, we see how it changes. We ask the question, do we understand why it's changing? And if so, are we having an impact on it? It's a simple question. And it turns out that we, we are, and we, we have the capability in a, in a broad sense with some accuracy to understand that. So we have very sophisticated computer models. They do quite well, and we get a range of predictions about what may happen in the future, given what's happening now. So that's just science. That's how you do science. Um, the problem 
is that it turns out that we have a very strong indication that some of the ways we behave are affecting the climate. That's our best scientific view, right? So it's just, it's models and measurements and so on. And so then the politics enters, I suppose, because unfortunately, the, the thing that's changing the climate is, is a thing that a lot of us like to do, right? So flying around in planes or using, using energy is, is, is a thing that we all enjoy. And that's where the politics comes in. Um, so, but I, and this is, many scientists have different views of how to deal with this. I, I like, which is quite naive in a way, but I like to try at least to separate the, what we know and what comes out of the models from the policy responses to it. The policy responses are the thing that I think are controversial. Problem, of course, the reason that's a naive statement, though, is that, of course, politicians are disingenuous. <laughs> so if they want a particular policy outcome, they will look for the little bit of the foundation of our knowledge to, in, to attack that they can to try and change public perception. And, and so that's, that's the problem. It's a complicated, it's complicated, it's not complicated in a scientific sense. I mean, I, I don't mean that. It is, it's very complicated science, but I, the, the science is broadly we understand it. Um, but it's complicated in the way that we respond because the things that we're being told by the models are uncomfortable. Um, so that's what I would say. So, so what Greta Thunberg said exactly this, this week and has said it before. So what she said was, it's not about the science, it's not about the solutions because the science is there and it's provided the solutions. It's about well, action. The solutions, it's a good question because then, so what are the solutions? There, there are different solutions. Um, so you could say, uh, on one extreme, reduce global energy use. I think that's not only not possible, but actually not desirable, in, if you think about it. Um, you know, wh what are the numbers? Half the population live without clean water in the world. So to get clean water, you need energy and so on. So the places that we live and the places that we would want to live with low infant mortality rates and so on are places that have high energy use. It's not, it's not a coincidence. They're linked, correlated. Um, but it's not energy use that's the problem, it's the way that we produce it. So a solution is to, yeah, it, it takes a while to go to change to renewables in power grids, for example. Um, I was in Ireland actually yesterday, the day before yesterday, where they were launching their new target of becoming 70% renewables on the grid by 2025. Very ambitious actually for Ireland. Um, and so the initiatives like that can work. That's one solution, but it's quite hard. Um, and then you have big problems with things like aviation because you need to fly around. So the global economy works through that. Uh, and it's very hard to think of how you'd redesign planes at the moment. We don't really know how to do it because fossil fuels are very energy dense and so on. So, so there's huge numbers of, there's a huge amount of debate about what you do. The science doesn't really tell you what to do. It, it doesn't tell you what to do. What it does is it says, if you do this, then this. Or, or it may, technology, engineering may give you solutions. We, we, solar power is getting cheaper and more efficient. Battery technology is really important and is getting cheaper and more efficient and so on. So electric cars and so all these things are part of the mix. But I suppose the policy challenge is what, what do you choose to do as a government? Do you choose to, you know, this is politics and you choose to do tax fossil fuels more heavily? Do you choose to increase subsidies for renewables and battery technology, invest in R&D and so on? What do you do? That's, that's politics. So the, the carbon neutral um, target of 2050, you know, there's a lot of talk. They, the politicians seem to do, seem to be, do, seem to do on a habitual basis, can't help themselves, almost addictive basis, is that they, when they have a problem, they they have a target date of perhaps trying to solve it, which is as far away from their particular reign yeah. as possible, but sort of a, a little bit optimistic enough to quell any uprising, yeah. that seems to be 2050. And anybody that knows about this is saying, no, it's yes, we need this yesterday. Yes. I think there's a, you hit the nail on the head there, and it's a, I don't want to mention it again, but you mentioned Brexit, right? Oh. I'm not going to, I'm not saying anything about it, other than it's, to me, there's something interesting about it, which is what they did without thinking and, and noticing that's the way they always behave is put a date there, right, when this happens. I mean, obviously, it may well get pushed into the future, but there's kind of a cutoff. And I think that's quite alien to many, to the way that many politicians think. It's more like engineering 
I, I said that in some way. That, I think Brexit is more like engineering in that sense, but also this question. Because nature, reality, does not care about who you are or which party you're from or what you, uh, which school you went to or whatever it is. It doesn't care. There, there is a reality here. And I think that in generally, I think running, I think r running societies is kind of rather more malleable. As you said, you can kind of move things around and you don't really see the impacts of your policies and people argue about how you measure them, maybe social policy or health policy. You can have a debate. But with the climate, you can't, you can't debate with nature. <laughs> right? It doesn't care. You can have a go. <laughs> no, yeah, but you will lose. Yeah, right? You, you cannot have a debate. And so I think you're right that it's a very different situation. And the only parallel I can draw is, is Brexit, where I think there is a reality to, if you, if, you, you know, if you crash out and cut off your trade, you will find out what happens. You're going to find out what happens in a few months, and you can't dodge it. Yeah. And it's the same, it's much more serious with climate, of course. Um, but so I think it needs a resetting of the mindset. There's actually, there's a, the, I mentioned it before, Richard Feynman, that great book. Um, well, well, actually the essay, I can't remember which book it's printed in, but there's the essay, The Value of Science, um, which you can get online for free. So Feynman Value of Science, it's there at Caltech, I think. And uh, he wrote it in 1955, and he'd come out of the Manhattan Project with people like Oppenheimer, who were also thinking in these terms. So they'd seen what their knowledge and their, the engineering expertise they'd enabled had done at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it was a shock, shock to all of them. And they strongly felt that, um, that the power they delivered to, into the hands of politicians and society would not be controlled. And they were very surprised they were alive in 1955, I think both of them. And it caused both of them and many other scientists at the time to reflect on the value of our civilization and how we behave and how we might save ourselves from ourselves. And in the value of science, um, Feynman talks about these conflicts um, in society and what can science bring to the discussion and, and it obviously points out first of all that scientists shouldn't run society right? that would be a disastrous thing to do but he says that the way that nature forces you to think is valuable because of this point that we've just spoken about which is that you can't dodge it right you do an experiment and you can be wrong uh, you, you, you can't really be right in science. We have models of the world and such, but you can definitely be wrong. And so he says, he says scientists have a very great experience with uncertainty and doubt and with being learning that they are not right. That, that's the actual professional skill that you develop. And it's that that's the most important thing, ultimately. That's what he says, that in, in terms of the value of science, it's that way of thinking. So I think... That's why, if you go to some practical solutions to our current political problems, I think that teaching science in schools, and particularly experimental science, is, should be absolutely compulsory and valued for this reason, that not because you learn about the science, but you learn about what it means to, to be shown that your opinion is worth absolutely nothing, right, in, in the face of nature. And that one lesson... We can all think of examples of people who should learn that lesson, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in public life. Yeah, yeah. But, na I mean, nature doesn't do time because we invented time. So, you know, clock time is a human construct. It's a human concept. Psychological time is a result of our own, um, the, way, the way our brains work, the way, the, the way we were made up. And when we abuse a concept that is otherwise useful, which is our abuse of time to put a target on climate change, for example, or Brexit, then it all begins to go wrong. And nature works with processes and cycles, doesn't it? Yeah, and right. what's, what's the thing that I once read or saw, I think it may have been another Einstein thing, where time is just an arrow? Well, again, <laughs> there's a lot of we don't knows in this fundamental physics. So we don't know what time is. Um, we, there's one thing to say, though. We... So this time's arrow tends to be spoken about in the context of the science of thermodynamics, which is a, a subject that came out of Victorian France and England, actually, that, that period, where we're trying to work out how steam engines work, actually, and, and trying to sort of make them more efficient. And you get this whole, this whole series of fundamental insights into nature from just trying to build better steam engines, essentially. And uh, what we found was that so we understand uh, why the world 
goes from order to disorder. It's a fundamental law called the second law of thermodynamics. And what we know, but we don't know why, but we know that the universe just after the Big Bang was extremely highly ordered. Right? It's, it's called low entropy in the jargon, but it's extremely ordered. And we know that the universe in the far future will be extremely disordered. And that gives you an arrow of time. It's the, 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 see, the laws of nature don't have a, a completely symmetric. You can reverse time in Newton's laws or Einstein's equation, and, and they run exactly the same. And you wouldn't be able to see the difference between the future and the past in the, the fundamental underlying laws of nature. But of course, if I smash that glass onto the ground, then you can infer that, that that's something that happened after the glass was solid, right? So, so you, you say, well, so we understand that things tend to get more disordered and break. They don't spontaneously go back to being ordered again. So that gives you a direction. Given you what you know about the universe, it gives you a sense of a direction of what's the future and what's the past. The statement is the past is more ordered and the future is more disordered. So, and actually there's even more than that because it's, th there's a suggestion now that we, you might say, how does all this complexity emerge in the universe spontaneously from an ordered universe? Well, we, we now pretty well understand that in going from order to disorder, this natural arrow of time, the thermodynamic arrow it's called, that complexity can emerge temporarily in such circumstances. So the real question then becomes, why did the universe begin in this highly ordered state? And uh, you know what the answer is, don't you? No, of course not. <laughs> exactly. Got that's the I've answer. Got a clue. That's I'm so the... tired. That's, that's, that's the answer. That's the answer. Oh, thank God. What I haven't got a clue. It? <laughs> Nobody has a clue. Okay, it's one, the, it's one of the It's one of the great, the great I'm questions. I'm in the game. It's one of the great questions. In a, my, in brain is so, my brain is so... My brain is <laughs> melted ever or something. <laughs> How's everybody else doing? You all right? <laughs> <laughs> no. Right, where should there's, we only, there's only 20 minutes left, so we're all right. <laughs> yeah, that's clock time. Psychologically. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, I mean, we, we've touched on the end of the world. Well, we haven't, yeah. because climate change isn't, you know, I, I, we get lost to this on the show. People say, you know, we've got to save the planet. The planet's going to be fine. We're just going to be extinct. Well, so, oh, hang on a sec. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Brian, it's not easy for me. This you do it every day. <laughs> so we're in the middle of a sixth cycle of mass extin extinction now, mm. right? So up to two hundred species per day of organisms on the planet are becoming extinct, mm. which is a th between a thousand and ten thousand times more than the usual mean of the last couple of thousand, mm. tens of thousands of years. So, but we're in the middle of that now. So we may become extinct ourselves, okay? But the planet will still be here. Now, there's a lovely theory that I heard, and you don't have to respond to this. You're very welcome to, of course. You're Brian Cox, I haven't said. But I if, will respond. If, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. If we, if we get a fever, you know, our body heats up to kill off whatever it is that's bothering us. You know, there is a theory, it's quite a beautiful theory, that we are the, par we are the latest parasites on the organism that's the planet, and it's heating itself up to kill us off. But the planet itself will outlast us one way or another, as it's outlasted the dinosaurs and whatever. But, of course, one day our planet, too, will burn up and it'll, it won't exist anymore. But that's however many billions of years. Five billion, yeah. Five, five billion-ish, give or take a billion. Uh, but there is another theory that you've touched upon before about the fact that we're, all, you know, we are, we are continuously looking for the potential of life on other planets and moisture and water, and that's the beginning. But there, ha the, there is another side to that again let's look at that's the arrow going forward um but there's another theory that in the past other planets like ours have existed and we're not the first and we could learn more from maybe thinking about that than thinking about the future yeah i think the 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 key point for me because you hear it a lot and, and i see it a lot where people say you know well you know the planet will be all right and the ecosystem will be all right so it doesn't matter if, if we go as you said we're some pathogen or something I profoundly disagree with that way of thinking. Uh, for not just because you know we're, we're self-interested, but um, if th there is a strong argument to be made, um, if, if you ask the question, how many civilizations are there in a galaxy, a typical galaxy like the Milky Way? So 200 billion stars, 
we think that most of them have planets around them. We've discovered well over 3,000 planets around distant stars. So we can do statistics. And so we think there are probably 20, something like 20 billion potentially Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy, um, which are rocky planets, and they may have oceans and so on. So there are plenty of places where life could exist, even in the solar system, actually. On Mars, it could have existed in the past, at least. But so, you, so it looks like there's lots of stuff out there in the galaxy, life. But if you look at the history of life on Earth, which is the only measurement we can make, because we haven't detected life anywhere else, then it's a statement of fact that it took four billion years on this planet to go from the origin of life to now. And our civilization exists, you know, the now, basically, 10,000 years or something, so now. Four billion years is one third of the age of the universe. And from what we know about the conditions in the galaxy and the way that solar systems behave and the way that stars behave, it may be that there are very few places in the galaxy that have been stable on that kind of time scale. It's quite astonishing, actually, given what we know about astronomy and the way that solar systems evolve and stars evolve, that the Earth has remained habitable for four billion years. It's almost inconceivable. And that leads many biologists and astronomers who think about this in detail to suggest there is, it is possible that this is the only place in the Milky Way galaxy currently where a civilization exists. It is possible. It is conceivable. And so that means that if you think about it, so we go to the a deeper question. We, you know, as I said, Feynman asked that question, what is the meaning of it all in his essay? So what is meaning? Right, well, here we go, we've got 16 minutes left. So I think whatever meaning is, it is a property of life and a property of intelligence, I would argue. Now, you know, we have like, we know Bishop Nick Baines, for example, is a mutual friend, yeah. he might disagree with that. He might say meaning is global and there's some uh, God type thing. And that. But I would argue that meaning is a property of living things. And so if it's true that intelligence <coughs> only exists on this planet currently, in, a, in this galaxy at the moment, then I would argue this is the only place where meaning exists, because there's no intelligence anywhere else, in our, at least in the Milky Way galaxy. That makes us, as the, the intelligent species on this planet, uh, extremely valuable, in, in a, I think in a very direct sense. Because we, we, we I mean, let's put it more poetically, this might be the only island of meaning in a meaningless sea of 200 billion stars. That's what that logic leads you to. So the idea that you can say, well, it's all right for the planet, there are billions of planets. It doesn't matter. that You could blow the planet up. All you care about is planets. There are tens of, hundreds of billions of them. But there might be only one where anything thinks in this neighborhood. And so I think that pr pr puts a tremendous responsibility on us to sort these problems out, the climate, the politics that we have, how ridiculous would it be to, for us to have a, a nuclear war, for example? I mean, this is what Feynman and Oppenheimer were thinking about in the 50s. You, you might wipe out all intelligence in a galaxy. Why? You know, because uh, some idiot decides to press a button. Some, it's inconceivable. Somebody's so, unintelligent. So I think that we should proceed on that basis. We don't know. We, we're always looking. Right? We, we have a, the SETI program. We're trying to listen for radio signals out there. We're looking for other civilizations. We don't see any at the moment. We haven't looked too hard, though. So we, we, astronomers call it the Great Silence, which is a kind of ominous but correct title. It's, 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 why is it silent? We, we don't know. that. And it's a longer answer, I suppose. But we, we, we thought before we started listening, I spoke to a man called Fran, Frank Drake, who's very famous astronomer who founded the SETI program, the radio astronomer. And he thought in the 60s that all we had to do was turn the radio telescopes to, to the skies and we would hear them, all of them, because there are so many planets, there's been so much time. And he genuinely thought we'd be in a sea of radio waves, communications between civilizations. And uh, he was shocked that we heard nothing at all. It's absolute and silence. it might be that the absolute silence is down to the fact that there aren't any. Right, and then put put the, our behaviour in that context, and I think that's just that comes from the science at the moment. It's we don't know if there's anyone else out there. And so the fi the Feynman essay you got you, you carry that around with you, don't you? It's in my bag actually. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I was. How often do you read it? It's it's a it's a beautiful thing. It's a, I recommend it to everyone. I should have brought it with me actually. I could have read you the end. It's um, it, where he says, 
the end is, he says something like, it's our responsibility as scientists to, to basically preach this idea that the freedom of thought, um, the, the fact that we don't know everything now. He, he says, actually, I remember one of the lines, he says that uh, if we say to everyone, this is it, this is the way to do things, this is the way things are, and he says, he uses this phrase, man is saved, right, he said in his thing, Th then we will condemn future generations to this... Uh, to the, the, the tyranny of, of oppression. And, and he said it's been done many times before. Right? The, the problems we have are from people saying, this is the way that it is. Yeah. This, is, this, is th this God did this, or this political system is the best one, and this is how you do things. That's the, the thing. And, and what science teaches you is that. So he said it's the duty of all scientists to pr proclaim the value of freedom of thought for the safety of future generations. They have things to find out. You have to leave knowledge there's knowledge in the future that we don't have yet. That, that one statement, I think about that. There's knowledge in the future that we don't have. <laughs> you say that to Donald Trump. The, the, the stuff that the future will know that you don't. It's true. How much, <laughs> how much humor is there in quantum mechanics? Because the one... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll tell you why I asked that. Because my biggest suspicion of Donald Trump, and there are many, but my biggest is that he, he never laughs. He never laughs, ever. No. Beware the person who never laughs. He just doesn't laugh. At all. I've never seen him laugh. No. And I have a look next time. Every time you see him in the future, he doesn't laugh because he's entirely closed. He's never present. He's never in the moment. But then you, you've got a fantastic sense of humor. Einstein had a, had a legendary yeah, sense funny. of humor. Yeah. You know, Stephen Hawking, very, very, yeah, very funny. funny, really sarcastic, really sort of dark. Yeah. Dark, you know, back to dark energy and dark matter. Where, where's, where's, where's all the laughs in quantum, quantum mechanics, a, quantum physics? There's one actually, it's a real shame. Give actually. us your best quantum physics joke. <laughs> Three quantum <laughs> physicists walked into a pub. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, there's got to be one. This, uh, I can't think of any. I'm not a one a joke. To, I, 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 can't no, fair think, I can't think of any. No, fair enough. There's some okay. Heisenberg jokes, isn't there, about not, not. You know, speeding and things like that. <laughs> well, I, I know. I, I, I don't know how fast I was going, officer, but I know exactly where I was. <laughs> There's that kind of thing, isn't it? All right. So you talked about you talked about beauty, and you, you know we look at things that you know equations or whatever it may be, and all the words and all the numbers and all the all the different um, signs and things in all your books. And I've had a look, and they, they, they you know Stephen Hawking's book um, is what less than two hundred pages. You know, but the brief history of time. Yeah. The have you, have, who's read Brief History of Time? Okay. Who's bought it? <laughs> right. I'm in the board. I try to read it. It's so difficult. But you must find quantum mechanics so beautiful because if you don't find it beautiful, you can't navigate it. So you must find, you know, cosmos order. That's what it is, isn't it? The cosmos, that's what it means. Yeah. It means order. And so you've got your, you've got your four, four little mates. You've got your fab four in quantum mechanics. You've got atoms, nuclei, photons, and quarks. Which is your favourite? <laughs> <laughs> so... The quarks, so the, the idea is... They're, they're I like the, quarks, just, I just like quarks. quarks. They're, they're the fundamental building blocks, um, as, we, as far as we know. They, they probably aren't, but they, as far as we know, they are. So, so you need a two up quarks and a down quark to make a proton, and two downs and an up to make a neutron, and out of those you can make all the chemical elements and so on. So you'd have to go for the most basic building, but it's amazing, you only need two things, right? The up quarks and down quarks, and you can build us. So that's all we are, and the electron that goes around. So we're, we're three things. That, that's, that's it. And it's just a, a temporary pattern. So, so you're a temporary pattern of up quarks, down quarks, and electrons. Cool. And, but it's a cool, it is a cool I'm More pattern. than that at the moment, to be honest, mate, after the 52 <laughs> minutes with you. So, <laughs> so you've got your quirky quarks. By the way, I've not been drinking for ages. I've got half a month tomorrow. I'm going to get straight on it this afternoon. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm with you, actually. It's you? sponsored by Verve Clica, this. Isn't it? We can yeah. go and get, go and get it's all very drink nice. with Magnum afterwards. <laughs> See what happens. So you've got your quirky quarks. Let's talk about particles, atoms, molecules, and cells, then. So two particles get together, they form an atom. Two atoms get together, they form a molecule. Two molecules form a cell. Well, no, just to get combinations of them. So, so, as I said, you need three quarks inside a proton and three inside a neutron. Two protons and two neutrons would be helium. And uh, you know, so on six protons, six neutrons, it'd be carbon, and off you go. So you well, build when two particles get together and form an atom, there's this certain constituents to that atom that aren't found in the two particles. So where, where, does, where does all the new stuff come from? In, um, 
Well, you can make... You, in what sense? I, I don't understand. Well, so surely when two, two particles get together and form an atom. Yeah. Right. OK, so that's Lennon and McCartney come up with yesterday. That's what it is, isn't it? Yeah, in, it's, in, it's, a good, it's interesting, because the point is that... It, it is an, it's an Sorry, Brian, I'm just trying really hard. It's, no, it's, a, it's, an inter, it's an interesting point, because you think about what we just said. The, the claim is, it, it, as far as modern science is concerned, the claim is that g give, give me, give, give the universe some quarks and some electrons, um, and uh, the universe will give you, without anything else, uh, this, right? It will give us today this literature festival. And that's, that's a hell of a claim. And, and, but actually, what's interesting is we do understand the broad sweep of how that happened. There, there are some, in detail, we have different theories about how life began. We're talking about, I think the most, the most difficult thing to understand there is how you go from a, a, a planet that's just formed, which is dead, right? It's got no life on it, the Earth, four and a half billion years ago, to a living planet uh, under the action of a few simple laws of nature. How do you do that? And the, the answer is broadly we can see that chemistry gets more complicated in certain conditions. So carbon atoms have this ability to form big long chains of molecules, as you said. And, and it turns out some of those molecules can copy themselves. Just doing chemistry, nothing else. And that if you can copy yourself, you can pass information on. And if you can pass information on, then evolution by natural selection, which is a law of nature, uh, will take over. And it will, you, more complexity can emerge. But it's very easy to say that. And we know in principle how all that happens. But I still think it's worth stepping back and saying, God, it goes back to that idea that we're quite fortunate here on this planet. Because all those things happened on this planet. The chemistry got started thinking. I mean, Richard Feynman, again, he, he said that we are, what is a human being? We are atoms, collections of atoms that can contemplate atoms. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. So, so, and again, it goes back, does that happen often in this universe? <laughs> uh, it may well not happen often. But... <laughs> It's funny that some, some, other, some atoms can contemplate it better, other atoms better than other atoms can contemplate them better. So what's so special about your atoms then? You show off. Nothing. Oh, we say... No, oh, seriously, what makes, what, makes, what makes people cleverer than, you know... I don't think... I, I think that... I always say this in schools, because I go into a lot of schools sometimes, and, you know, one of the big problems we have is, um, is getting uh, kids, children, into science and engineering. Um, and... Uh, one of the things I always say is that you don't have to be sort of cl clever in some sense. It's not what, what you have to do is get be interested in, in unpicking these questions. You know, you, you go, why is the grass green, or why is the sky blue? It's a good question, it, uh, and it's not. It's just the, the idea that you would then pull away at those little threads. That's all it is. I mean, you know, because you can you, you write and present TV shows. Most people would find it impossible to prevent present a live TV show. It's, it's a skill that you've acquired, and perhaps some, some natural ability, but also a skill that you... If I, I mean, I could ask you that question. So do you think you have a, a natural ability to present live TV and radio, or do you think it was something that you, you acquired and I learned? you're drawn to it, aren't you, for some reason or another? I don't know why. Um, you're drawn to it, and then you try not to get in the way of it. That's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. You know, once, you, once, you, once you get out of the way of yourself, if you're dealing with a passion that you you're fortunate enough to, to have been born with, you, you know, the key is to not let your ego grow to the extent that it then thinks it has a say, because it doesn't. Yeah. And, you know, you just have to be present. I, will, I always think you have to be, the best thing you can do, and I've talked to Paul McCartney about this and people, you know, who I talk to more regularly um, than most, and, I, and I, I, about, about, you know, Paul McCartney wrote, let it be, and um, not the long and winder. Hey, he, he wrote, "Let it be," and "Hey Jude" in the same afternoon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, what's that about? You know, you can't think of those two songs. They have to be available. They have to be around, and you have to be open and available to, to have them. I know it sounds a bit weird, but yeah. channel through you. I mean, that, that's a lot that's of musicians a, say that, don't they? That yeah. the songs are there. Yeah. And you, is that trying to understand what consciousness is and what creativity is? Consciousness, because there's a, this whole thing about the fact that consciousness is, is, is the universe. You know, the universe is, is a conscious thing, and at our best we are conscious with it, and that's when we're totally present, and that's when we're formless and boundless. 
do you think about that? I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that. I know people like Deepak Chopra and say things, these things. And I don't agree. I, I think that whatever consciousness is, and we don't know, but an intelligence, it, it is a property of matter. I think it is a, that we, we are thinking now, it's very complex, but it's, it, we, we are patterns of atoms. So actually you start with matter. You start at the Big Bang with quarks and gluons and electrons and so on. And over those 13.8 billion years, given the laws of nature, this complexity like this has emerged in some places, maybe very few. So I think that, that's why I said earlier that I think, I, the, the, the only difference between myself and um, Nick Baines, for example, as I said, the Bishop of Liverpool, is a good, Leeds, yeah, Leeds, now, now, Leeds. Yeah. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, a good friend of yours. The only difference is I think that meaning is temporary and local and he thinks it is eternal and global. And those are the differences. But uh, so, so I think meaning emerges from patterns of atoms. Okay, but that's like, I think that in a way that's like somebody like in rock music and as a person like in, like in jazz music, because Nick is dead clever, you're dead clever. Yeah. And you just, you, you well, agree no, to... No, 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 going back to what you said though, I don't think, because when I asked you the question, you said it's opening yourself up to the passion, your passion and allowing you to be, and you're getting your ego out of the way and allowing you to do those things. It's the same in science. It's, I think there's no difference between what you've chosen to do and what Paul McCartney chose to do and what scientists chose to do. It's all, I think it's all about how you, that's a good thing you said actually, how you move yourself out of the way yeah. and let the ideas it's beautiful. come. Uh, when you do things like this that last about an hour, you're supposed to finish, you know, they say yeah, try and finish with the Big Bang, but we started with the Big Bang. <laughs> so, I'm, so I can only apologise. Um, <laughs> we've got a minute left. So, so what, what, happened, what was going to happen next is Eric Hyde was going to do, uh, do, do something in here, but, and Brian was going to do that with him. But uh, Eric uh, is, um, unfortunately, he's got some issues at home, genuine issues, so he can't, he can't make it. So Brian has agreed to stick around now. I know a lot of you have got lunch booked and things like that. Um, and, of course, this is the end of the session. Uh, so please, you know, don't feel like, you know, you have to hang around. But if you want to, we are willing to do a, a, a talk on call, if you like. <laughs> Um, so well, if you want our questions or something. Yeah, exactly. We'll so if you want to, we'll do another 10, 15 minutes, but if you want to go, this is the end of the session. So if you want to go, can you leave now, um, please? Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, one second. And by the way, if anybody's at the back and they want to stay, then there's obviously going to be some free seats. So let's just have a, a, a quick minute, Chibi. And then we'll just start again. We'll do a, a quick 10 to 15 minutes. A quick, t I don't even, a quick 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, a 10 like to that, 15 yeah. minutes. <laughs> okay. Was that? It's not up, is it? What was that? I was saying it's a microphone up. I could have, you could have had a chat. But... Thanks for coming. If you're leaving, thank you so much for coming. We hope you had a nice time. Yeah, thank you. Well done. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll start again then. Um, we've, got we've got a new countdown here. We've got a 10 minute, 10 minute let's countdown. Do, let's do a mad 10 minute question session, okay? So um, here we go. Uh, he has a question. Is it from my bookmark? Are you sure? Because I will know. Okay, what's your question, pal? Um, what you were saying about uh, meaning coming from matter. Primo Levi in periodic table. There's a microphone there. Okay. okay. Um, You're not just showing off, are you? No. Okay, fair in enough. In the periodic table, Primo Levi wrote a short story called Carbon, in which he says, so Mozart, incredibly talented, dies, decomposes, and his atoms end up being born ultimately in Paul McCartney or, other, or Donald Trump or, or other less uh, famous yeah. keyboard players. Yeah. Um, and the reason they are musically talented, maybe it's because they've got some of Mozart's atoms in them. <laughs> Is that basically what, what you're suggesting? No. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't one of my I, I questions. <laughs> Should have used the bookmark. No. It, the, the, the build, because the, the reason, I mean, the, our building blocks are not the point, right? And in fact, they are. We, we, I, I can't remember the number, but we, 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 all our atoms are recycled many, many times throughout our lives, hundreds, thousands of times. So, so, so we exchange the atoms with the environment all the time. And what we don't exchange with the environment is the pattern. 
So, so the, 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 ma the individual, the magic, if you like, is, is in the pattern of the atoms, not the constituents, I think. OK, questions? Anybody else? OK. What's your name? Imani. Where are you from? Uh, Dorset. And your question, please. Um, at the University of Virginia's Perceptual Studies Department, uh, they research near-death experiences and uh, kids who remember past lives and out-of-body experiences. Do you think it's possible that the mind can exist separately from the body or that there could be life after death? No, no I mean, as I said, I, I, I personally don't um, because I, I think... I mean, if, if you just look at the, the, the physics of it, what, what we are, it's the same as the last question in a sense, we're, we're information, right? information has to be present somewhere. And uh, information needs um, a structure to, to be held and to persist. And it, so if you start talking about, um, it's interesting actually, if you talk, let's, let's call it a soul for want of a better word, whatever this thing is that's not physical, but is a, what, what is it? So you could start as a physicist, if you were given this idea, you, you say you, you have some kind of essence that is you that is not contained within the matter <coughs> that is you, it's something else. Then, so you, you start by saying, well, first of all, whatever it is, this, this energy source, whatever, it, it has to interact with the matter because presumably, if I have a, some soul that's separate from this, then if I do this and lift my hand up and move around, then it's doing it, right? So it's interacting somehow. So the first thing to say is whatever it is, it interacts with matter. And then, so then you say, well, what possible stuff could there be there that interacts with matter that we haven't yet discovered? Because it's something we haven't seen yet. And then um, it turns out that actually the, the, the experiments we do at places like the LHC at CERN, what it really, we're really doing is, is trying to understand the interactions of matter. And it's incredibly precise. The, the way that we understand how matter interacts is so constrained now that when we're trying to find things that we don't understand, because that's what we like, we want some new insight. And it turns out it's extremely restrictive. So, so what you could propose, we, we look for so a fifth force of nature, for example, which would be something you're describing. It would be some kind of other interaction. And we just don't see it. So it's not to say there isn't some other interaction, but it's very, very subtle. And so, so I would say, to me, it, it, it doesn't make any sense, knowing what I know, to postulate that there is something that interacts with our bodies but is other than our bodies that is a part of nature we haven't yet observed. It, it would have to be a very, very subtle interaction, I, I'd say. Dark <laughs> well, as I said, dark matter interacts gravitationally, so we've seen it. So we've seen, seen the... Uh, OK, um, another question, please, anyone? Uh, Peter from London. Um, you mentioned about the uh, dark matter and the fact that there's uh, five times more of it than there is uh, regular matter. Uh, if we can't see it, how do you equate it? So we, we, we see it by... It, so it's a, it's a question of what do you mean by see. So we observe its presence by its gravitational interaction. So that's an interaction, so we see it. Um, it now, we don't see it with our eyes because it doesn't interact with light. So what we're postulating is there is a source of matter that doesn't interact with light but interacts gravitationally. And actually, we know of, that there are particles that do that. So there are particles called neutrinos that we have discovered, which do not interact with light, so-called electromagnetic force, but they, they only interact through the weak nuclear force, which is one of the other four forces of nature, and gravity. And so there are, there are about 60 billion of those per centimeter squared per second passing through your head, right, from the sun. Um, so they come from nuclear reactions in the sun. And we can just about detect them because they interact very weakly with matter. So we have big detectors, and we detect a few, a handful per day in our big detectors, uh, or, or maybe a handful per week, let's say. So, so they're very hard to detect, but we can study them. And uh, so that's the... So, so it's, what, what you mean by C in a technical sense is do they, do they interact? Oh, the five. Yeah, um, so by the fact that, so it's the same question as how do you weigh, 
how do you weigh the sun, for example? And uh, the, the way you weigh the sun is to look at the orbits of planets around the sun. And um, if you know the distance and you know the, the, the orbits and so on, and you calculate the mass. So you do it through the theory of gravity. So, so essentially the idea is that because you know how gravity works, if you see something that's behaving in a particular way, you can infer how much mass there is. You can weigh it. And that's how we weigh a planet. It down. Well, let's do three more questions. Make it, uh, only put your hand up if you've got a great question, OK? <laughs> <laughs> you, sir, stand up, please, if you don't mind. Uh, hi, I'm Kit from Hampshire. Um, you talked a bit about scientific intuition earlier. When there are various interpretations of quantum theory, can we, um, is that the only way we can choose a particular one uh, out of the Copenhagen interpretation of the many worlds theory? Or are we going to aspire to find a, um, a real answer in the future? It's a, it's a, a great question, just a, a one minute of, of background. So quantum mechanics is our theory of everything other than gravity. So, so Einstein's theory sort of sits aside. It's what's called a classical theory. Everything else is quantum mechanics, and it works, and it's, it's remarkable. I mean, you can't build transistors without it. You can't. So, so it's, it's our underlying theory of everything else. Um, but it has this issue with it, which is associated with what it means to measure something, essentially. Um, and and uh, the, the issue... Is, is bizarre in a physical theory, in a sense, are unsettling, because it requires an interpretation. So there's something in the theory that's not well defined. Um, and uh, so we, that leads to, as you said, different interpretations of it. And the answer is there's no commonly agreed interpretation of what quantum mechanics, put it this way, it's what does that theory mean for reality? What kind of reality is that theory describing? At face value, it is a very different kind of reality from the one we experience. So it's kind of unsettling in that sense. I mean, it really is, at its basic level, a reality, if you take it at face value, where everything that can possibly happen, happens. Now, that's not what we experience. In the subatomic world, we see it. We see you, you have to calculate, if you want to calculate how a particle goes from A to B, you allow it to wander, essentially, in the maths, the entire universe on its journey from A to B. And when you add up all those different paths, you get the right answer for how likely is it to get to B from A, right? So it works. But the, but the question is, well, what do you mean? That you, this thing inhabits the, the entire, entirety of space and time, in, in some sense, as a little particle. What does that mean for reality? And that's where the problem is. That, that's in an interpretational sense. We don't have an answer to that. So there are some people which Feynman was one, I think, who embodied this idea. It's called the shut up and calculate school of physics, which is it doesn't matter what happens in the black box. You get the right answer, so who cares? But <laughs> physics, is, physics is not like that. Physics is supposed to be, many people think, a description of reality. And then it becomes unsettling with quantum mechanics, is what sort of reality is it that you're describing? And that's what you say. So uh, I don't know that... that and, and this has been made very real, I should say now, by quantum computing. Because quantum computers exist and do work and, in a very real sense, perform multiple calculations in what you might almost call multiple different parts of reality at once. And out comes an answer which a classical computer could never do. Right? And, and so we're at the point now where this is a technology that works and appears to suggest that reality is far richer than the reality, the, the reality that we experience. So it's becoming a real issue. It's like, well, these damn things are going to be in our iPhones in 10 years. <laughs> right? well, how are they working? What, the, what are they actually doing? Right, let's have uh, two more questions. Uh, who's chomping at the bit? You, you look like you might be chomping at the bit. I should All say, right. it, won't be ten, it won't be 10 years. It'll be 50 years before there's a quantum iPhone, I'm sure. But you never know. But anyway, It's a very yeah. political response. Okay, go on, off you go. Uh, I'm Emma, I'm from Australia. Uh, you talked about a few scientists and their essays that you found really inspiring. Mm. Um, and since we're at a literary festival, I want to know uh, what novels have given you that same level of excitement. What novels? I just, uh, I've got a really predictable answer, but it is honestly that the last novel that I read over, over the summer, I went back to The Rings of Saturn, Seaball's novel, you know, which every, probably everybody's read. So it's probably not a good recommend. If you haven't read it, you should read it. And, and I thought it was a, it's the most beautiful um, depiction. It, it, it addresses this central question, which I think is the only interesting question, actually, 
and that coming from a physicist's perspective, which is, as I've just said all through this hour, that what, what, how do you make sense of living a meaningful life in a meaningless universe? That's what I think, actually. The, all we've spoken about is actually we're talking about that. That's what I think how a situation is. That's what, and that, that novel is a beautiful attempt, I think, to address the finite nature of existence and the fact that it is clear, as far as we understand cosmology, uh, the way that we think the universe is going to un unfold, there will come a time in the universe when the meaning is gone, that structure goes. In this universe, as far as we know, the universe will expand forever. It's accelerating in its expansion. Stars live finite lives. Galaxies live finite lives. There comes a time, as far as we know in astrophysics, where no new stars will be made. All the stars go out. And I call it the age of starlight. The age of starlight is finite. So the age of structure, and therefore, in my view, the age of meaning is finite. Now, these are huge time spans, but I'm interested that in principle, that is the case. And uh, it, so th that, I think, mirrors the, the, the thing that we all grapple with, which is the finite nature of our lives. And that's what you see in a novel like that. Actually, just as an aside, I'm doing an event in uh, Melbourne in um, a few months with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. And it's based on this idea. The, the, the idea was that if you want to know, if you want to grapple with these ideas, which are suggested by science and cosmology, the finite nature of existence, what, why not go to listen to someone like Mahler, who had a lot to say about that? So actually, the, the, the event we're doing in Melbourne is we're, we're doing the first movement of Mahler's 10th, actually, and some Sibelius at the start. And, but, and using cosmology to say these ideas that Mahler grappled with and eloquently described the, the conflict and the problem he had intellectually with the finite nature of life, the, 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 he has something to say about the, the feelings that are, 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 are um, raised in us when we think about cosmology. Because the same problem. It's just this is just vast and it's temporary and vast and we are temporary and small. So what does that mean? Well, you know, art has a lot to say about that. OK, time for one more question. Um, maybe somebody at the front, because I know they queued up for ages to get in, so that must mean they're really enthusiastic and probably deserve a question. Is it any good looking in the eye? <laughs> yeah, no pressure. It's the last question of the whole session. This guy over here, he looks quite clever. He's got a question as well. Um, anybody else got a question? You got a question as well? Can we, should we do three really quick? Oh, I'll do quick. I'll do quick. Okay. Can you, There's it, one there, isn't it? What's the no, not the questions. The answer's not long. I don't know if you've noticed. I couldn't hear. I can't just hear arrived. It, Go. <laughs> My father-in-law is a physicist. One minute it, answers. Every time he starts talking about physics, I understand the first 10 seconds and then nothing else. I, I just wondered how you find that path between describing something incredibly complicated to make it understandable to a wide audience. Good question. Uh, Great question. Be, because, uh, because I understand things myself often very slowly, and actually I think that's the, the training as a scientist, probably is in any academic field actually, is to not move on until you've actually understood something. And I always say to my students actually, the, you know, it's just it's cliche in a way, but you can fool yourself very easily. You know when you understand something. And I think most of us actually tend to not be honest with ourselves about the concepts and go, do we actually understand that or are we just moved on? It takes quite a long time to understand things. And I've always found that. So I'm pretty slow. But once I've understood it, then I, I won't forget it because I've understood it. And then I just say what the what I did, what the process that I went through. But it takes ages sometimes. That's a, that's a great answer, the fact that if you know something, you don't have to remember it. No, but it takes a long that. time yes, to great. know it. OK, off you go. Do you think we're going to be usurped by artificial intelligence? Because you haven't actually mentioned that yet, and uh, a hybrid yeah. form of human and cyborg. It's a good question, artificial intelligence. It's very topical at the moment, because I think it's becoming a real issue. Um, it's. Uh, how are we going to deal with the fact that it is possible that in the next coming decades we produce machines that are more capable than us? I mean, there are obviously machines that are more capable than us now, but in an intellectual sense. And I, I don't know, because everything I've said about the, the fact that I think whatever intelligence is, it's a property of matter, that, that implies that you can have intelligent machines. 
Um, and uh, and there's, a, there's an even more, that that's kind of might seem very science fiction, but there are, there's an example I read recently, I can't remember where it was, an essay, which pointed out that, so let's say that we, we, under, we have expert systems now, right, in the NHS and so on, you, you have you, you, your interfaces with a machine, it can give you answers. And some of those expert systems make decisions. That, that a very good example would be driverless cars, which is coming. Um, and the, so it, I, I spoke to Eric Schmidt about this, actually, at an event, because um, Google are into driverless cars. So what do you tell the programmer to do? The, the, the programmer, the, the, the group of programmers in the little office in wherever, California, can program anything you want in terms of behavior. But you have to face moral issues with that. So for example, if your car's going along and it gets into a situation where it has to swerve for some reason, and let's say the situation is you can run over an old person or a young person, right? So now that's a very obviously a very well-known and complicated philosophical dilemma. Uh, but you've got to do it. You, the, the car will make that decision. So do you let the car make that decision? Or do you code it in? And if you code it in, you've got to have a very long conversation <laughs> about what you're going to code in. And th so these issues are actually not science fiction in terms of Blade Runner or something like that. They're actually real. In driverless cars, you can imagine an expert system that is charged with pressing the button on the nuclear weapons. So you could imagine coding in that if you see these things, that, that some, there's a launch over there and a launch over there, and, and we, our country's under attack, respond very quickly. You see them in financial markets as well, actually, these kind of systems. The, the, the point is that that is artificial intelligence. So it's, not, it's, it's quite a serious it's issue. Not, it, so far, it's not infinite art, artificial intelligence. It's finite because of the, the algorithms that have been programmed. Yeah, they're, they're, not, they're, they're not yet conscious. But, but you know, so that's another level of complexity on it. But I was just saying that even now we're facing ethical, we're, we're telling machines, with driverless cars, we're essentially telling a machine to make ethical decisions. That we are already doing that. And so that's difficult. What do you do? And but that's similar to our own hard drive. So our, our intelligence is based on the things that we've experienced and then effectively, or, you know, um, Load, synthetically loaded onto our hard drive, so we make decisions from that bank yeah. of information and experience. However, then you bring art into it, and that's when something else goes on, and that's about in intellect or... Yeah, I mean, you're asking the deep... It's called the hard question in a, this kind of research, which is, what, what is consciousness? And you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're posing that question. And again, <laughs> don't know. nobody knows. It's called the hard right, question. Right, one more question. There you go, sir. Thank you. Um, a short question, but it might need a very long answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I think I've I got 22 I, seconds I, left. I, I, I understood you to say, Professor Goss. Thank you for a fascinating talk. It's been an amazing discussion. But I think you, talk, I think you, you said that we don't really know what time is. Hmm. It would be very interesting to hear your thoughts about what you think it is and how current perceptions of it are changing. No, um, just very briefly. So we, we have different models that, that use time. So um, just, te for example, Einstein's theory, of, we talked about that a lot, relativity. That time there is, is quite literally a dimension. You have this thing called space-time. It's four-dimensional. You have three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. The, the way that you define those moves around, and this is where you get all this idea of moving clocks run slow and moving rulers shrink and so on. It's all... Um, so the world is four-dimensional in Einstein's model, and that's what time is, but it's a model, right? That, that, then we have the so-called thermodynamic one, which I talked about, where it's, it's the direction in which the universe becomes more disordered, right? Which is, and uh, actually, Sean Carroll is a great um, author. He's got a book out at the moment about quantum mechanics, so I'd strongly recommend. Now, he had a beautiful description. He said that, so the laws of nature, as I said, the laws of nature don't care which way you run time at the fundamental level. You can go forward or backward, you can't tell the difference. They just do it. Uh, but you obviously can, we can tell the difference. And he said it's like, in space, in, in the laws of nature, there's no preferred direction in space, right? So everything's symmetric. But if you put a big thing in space, like the Earth, then direction appears <laughs> because of the presence of the Earth. And the way that time is described in thermodynamics is that there is a big thing in the past which is the Big Bang, which is an asymmetry, right? And that defines a direction in time. 
that's a nice way to think about it. But it still doesn't explain what, what it, what, when you say what it is, we, we honestly don't know. We, we, and that's why those descriptions are not satisfactory when, I, when, when physicists say them. They're not satisfactory because they are partial explanations of how our models incorporate time. But the actual fundamental, of what it is, is not known. Well, that's all we have time for. <laughs> um, Brian Cox.